All right, y'all, so we'll go ahead and get started. I don't know if there's like a formal process for how this is supposed to work, so I'm gonna just dive right into it. So my name is Christian Hill. I'm a 2017 ECU College of Business grad, and here to talk to you guys a little bit about your next steps as young professionals and this big leap you're gonna take, right? You guys are gonna go from like eighth grade running the middle school hallways to ninth grade where you know, you're know you very bottom of the totem pole all over again. And by the way, you're gonna have that transition over and over and over again in your career. So um, this is kind of the first start to, to that uh, experience. Um, and I hope you guys get better at it each time. So hopefully some of the things that I'll talk about with you today will help you with that process. Um, so let me kind of shoot you straight here. Here's what I want for you guys coming out of this event. I want to give you guys a very straightforward, you know, we can call it a guide if you want to, of how you can be successful no matter what job you land in, in your first couple years out of school, right? So again, you're making a huge transition, probably the hardest jump you're ever going to make in, in your entire career coming up right ahead of you. And I don't say any of that to scare you guys, but to make sure that you're prepared and that you're ready for it. So here's what I'll do. I'm going to walk you through some, some very basic concepts. Like I want you guys to take this stuff home with you and actually have something that you can use when you're thinking about making your career transition. I don't want this to be some lofty thing where I'm talking about concepts that are super high level. I want it to be basic rudimentary things that you can take to the bank and know if you do these things, you're gonna be successful. So we'll start with the very first one, which I actually had towards the bottom of the list, but I, I like to move this up to the top. And the first one is, is that between now and when you guys graduate, it's essential that you take some time to get to know yourself. And what I mean by that is we heard Raj talking a little bit about self-awareness this morning. For those of you that were here for the keynote, everything else is secondary. If you don't know who you are, you don't know why you're doing what you're doing, and you don't know why you woke up and are going through the motions on any given particular day, right? You need to understand that fundamentally. And there's a reason for that, a very practical reason for that, right? If you know who you are and you know why you're doing what you're doing, it becomes very easy to show other people who you are and why you're doing what you're doing. And you're going to be constantly asked that question, not directly, but indirectly all the time. How many of you guys have heard about somebody from middle management getting cut or made redundant, right? Raise your hands. How many people have heard that term, middle management, and they got, they got cut or, or fired from a job, right, or laid off, right? It's because no one knows why they exist. Like, why the hell do these people exist? They just seem to fill space, and nobody really knows what they do, who they are, and what role they fill. You don't want to ever be the guy that gets made redundant because nobody knows what the hell you do, right? And that starts with you knowing it so that you can teach that to other people and demonstrate that to other people. Now, over time, as you're focusing on learning yourself, knowing yourself, that's gonna come naturally, or the next steps are gonna come naturally from that, is you're gonna start identifying things that you're good at and you're going to start identifying some things that you are not as good at, right? Or, you know, let's be pretty clear, right? We heard, uh, if any of you were in here with Matt earlier, Matt Slate, you heard a little bit about this. But all of us are going to identify the things that we suck at, right? And that we got to figure out and we got to work on, right? Now, I will be the first to tell you, I am a big proponent of once you've taken the time to do the introspection and to understand who you are. Talk to your family and friends by, about that, by the way. If you're having trouble going through those exercises of understanding who you are. Ask the people that you are closest with their opinions. That will help you to shape these ideas of who you are. Once you recognize those, you can work until you're blue in the face to get really good at something that you're just not naturally very good at and you're never going to be great at it. You, you'll get better, but you'll never be great. You'll never be as good as somebody who has a natural inclination for that thing. So I'm a huge proponent of once you go through the process, identify that thing that you're really good at and double down, triple down on that thing. Because that's the thing that makes you unique, right? That's the thing that makes you you, right? Spencer here is sitting in the front row. Spencer was a couple years younger than me, so we sort of missed each other in school except for the very end. 
but I know Spencer by his reputation for who he is and the things that he's really good at. Right? Spencer is really great at making relationships. He's really good at getting out and meeting people. He's really good at making people feel important. Right? He leans into that. He's excellent at it. And it's going to be the thing that helps him take his next step. Right? So all of you have those things. You have to identify them and you got to double and triple down on them because those are the things that make you genuinely and sincerely unique. Right? You'll have the stuff that you're not so good at, and we gotta, we got to improve that where we can. But I don't want you guys trying to become a person you're not because somebody else told you that you need to be that person. Okay? Awesome. So, next step. Once we feel like you've done a good job of knowing yourself, you've, you're building your brand, and you can sell that when you get that first job. The next step is you're going to be joining a workforce of people that are your parents' age, and in some cases your grandparents' age. Right? How do you earn the respect? How do you get anyone to take you seriously when you're 22, you look like their grandkid, and you need to get them to listen to you and to, to actually take what you're saying seriously, right? We've got to build trust. Right? Again, you'll probably hear that theme throughout the day-to-day -day as you meet with different folks and you sit in on different sessions, but you've got to be able to build trust. So how do you do that, right? It's easier said than done. There's some super, super simple ways to build trust, guys. You ready? Show up on time. I didn't do this in my first job. I regularly showed up three minutes late, four minutes late. I had a call center job. So I had to be on the phone, punched in at a very specific time, and it was very easily tracked when I showed up late. And I had to go meet with, people, meet with my boss every week and explain why I showed up three times four minutes late. And you know what happened? When all of my buddies that I got hired with, trained with, that I went out and took our first calls with, they got promoted and I didn't. And it was, there was no ambivalence about it. Like they told me, you can't show up on time. That, that's unacceptable, okay? Show up on time. That is going to be, if you're trying to earn the trust of the older generations in the workforce that have that sort of old school mentality, that's the first way you can do it. Make sure you're on time. Second step is, is do the little stuff right, right? We've all heard that annoying quote from our parents about how making sure, you know, it doesn't matter what job you do. If you're sweeping floors as a janitor, make sure you're the best damn you know, floor sweeper that they've ever seen, whatever. It, it really holds true, guys. You're gonna get assigned small tasks when you start getting into the workforce because nobody trusts you yet, right? You don't deserve to do any of the big tasks, the things that have some serious impact and significance to them. You haven't earned it yet. How do you earn it? When you get asked, one, to show up on time, start with that, right? That's, that's step one. And then two, when you get that little project that doesn't seem like it's all that important, knock it out of the park. Treat it like it is the billion dollar deal, okay? Because if you do that with the first small task, you get a second task that's a little bit more important, and a third that's a little bit more important than that one. And next thing you know, you're the guy on the team, even though you have the same seniority as everybody else, that's being given the biggest jobs, the biggest accounts, the most important tasks. You're getting that time with leadership. They're pulling you into meetings and asking you questions. You're like, I just started six months ago. I don't know what I'm doing. But you've built trust. They trust that you do. They trust that you know the job. Okay? Three, have a good attitude. Again, seems so basic, so simple. But I joined a team when I was coming out of school. I'd been working for about six months. I got my first promotion after all my friends got theirs first. And I joined a team that was the most senior team in our department. A bunch of guys that had been around for years. They knew what they were doing. They were super, super smooth but their numbers were terrible, like worse than the department by quite a large margin, right? And it was because their attitudes were horrendous. I mean, they were taking people like me, and if, I was, if they caught me smiling, I literally got shit for smiling. People would be, what are you smiling at? What are you smiling at, Hill? Your morning can't be going that well. I just got off this call and I did that. And they would just start like beating people down, like beating them. And so that toxic mentality had seeped into the whole team. And it was directly affecting their bottom line and their performance. So 
Come in and be positive. Look at those people in the eye and say, you know what, because I've got a guy in mind. You know what, George? I can appreciate that you've been here a while and that corporate's beat you down, man, but I'm going to lift you back up. And he's going to get real annoyed at you. He's going to roll his eyes at you. But if you do that every single day, five days a week, you know what starts to happen when George sees you? He chuckles and he rolls his eyes and he smiles instead of talking shit, which is what he was doing prior. Right? And even though he was only talking it to me at that given moment in time, everybody heard it. So they would do it too. And they would get the other new guy and they would talk crap to him. Right? And they, just, they wanted to force this. They wanted everyone to be as miserable as they felt. Right? Now you guys can flip that on its head. You can make everybody as excited and energized as you feel. You can elevate everybody by just consistently being positive, optimistic, even sometimes obnoxiously so. Make a joke about it. Like, you don't have to be the guy that's like taking himself super seriously and like you're wearing it like it's a badge of honor. You can joke about it, you can laugh about it, but make it clear that you're here to have fun and enjoy yourself. And it's, it's infectious. People can't help that when you have that attitude day in and day out. Now, I'm gonna jump up here and grab a bottle of water while I pull up my next point. And I can understand why Raj didn't wanna be up here. This is really uncomfortable if I'm being honest. Okay, so next thing on our list here is you've got to give trust before you're going to receive it. There's going to be a time where you're asked to do something and you've got to work with a part of a team to make sure that it happens. You've got to get it done, right? Especially when you're early in your career, you're, you're going to be doing a lot of teamwork stuff. In order for people to trust you, someone's got to give trust first, right? Who's all seen the Spider-Man memes where it's the three Spider-Mans and they're all standing there like pointing at each other, right? Like somebody's got to be the first one to drop the gun. Someone's got to be the first one to be willing to say, I'm going to put myself at risk here if this doesn't work out. And I've got news for you guys. You're the ones that are the least trustworthy, right? By your track record, right? You're the sketchy one, not them. They've got a track record. So you have to be the one that is willing to trust first, right? And if that trust bites you, if it comes back to haunt you that you trusted and someone let you down, own it, right? Don't point fingers, don't blame, say, you know what, that's on me, right? Because it is. You chose to trust. Christian told you to and you did it and now look where you're at and you're annoyed. Own it because the next time you do that, you're not going to get let down or maybe you will, but the third time you won't. Right? And once, you, once people around you start seeing that you're giving the trust first, it becomes so much easier for them to start trusting you with bigger topics right? and more meaningful topics. Okay, so now that we have effectively identified who we are, we've sold our brand, we're optimistic, we're giving trust, the next step is, is we need to learn how to start communicating up and down the organization. Okay. So when you guys get into corporate America, my first job was at Fidelity Investments. It's like 70,000 plus people, okay? Huge organization. You have to be able to effectively communicate with people, not only, I would say below you, you guys will probably be the bottom of the totem pole for the most part. You gotta be able to communicate though with the people that are on your level around you. You also have to be able to communicate effectively up the chain of command as well. Now, this is very important if you guys actually want to excel and excel quickly. This is the difference between you guys getting the promotion in a year and getting it in three years. If you effectively communicate your brand to leadership, look, you're gonna be standing around with a bunch of other 22 year olds who are just as uncertain about themselves as you are. But if you do a better job of acting like you aren't and you hone your communication skills and you make them sharp, you're going to stand out. Whether you actually know any more than your colleagues doesn't matter because the way you're communicating yourself or communicating your messages says that for you. It builds confidence in you guys. So how do we learn to communicate and, and, and do this successfully, right? This is gonna sound super ridiculous and super basic. Learn how to speak and articulate yourself and learn how to write like a college graduate, okay? That means no shorthand, 
get rid of the acronyms, use proper punctuation, understand how commas work, right? Like guys, basic stuff. But you're gonna be amazed, you're gonna get in the workforce. I've got a colleague, I get emails and I have to proof her emails every single week when she sends them out. She's 32 years old, she's got two college degrees and I have to proof her emails before they go out because they're horrendous. I mean, it's like stuff that a fourth grader would write, right? As far as you know, punctuation, grammar, et cetera, right? Articulate yourself, speak slowly. If you don't feel confident speaking in front of a group, l speaking slowly for you might be a good way to make sure you're saying what you wanna say and you're not rushing through it. You might feel self-conscious about that, but that actually indicates thoughtfulness, right? To the people that are listening. It indicates someone that has high intelligence, right? When you weigh your words before you speak them, that's how it's perceived. So learn how to read and write. We'll take you straight back to elementary school, okay? Next piece here, learn to simplify complex topics, okay? So all of you, when you get your first job, more than likely, you're gonna be a member of a team who is tasked with a very specific job, right? So when you get into leadership, your job gets less and less specific. You're catering to more people, you have more responsibilities, the organization is your target, right? When you are in your entry level job, you're gonna have one specific task. For me, it was answering the phone when a 401k participant called and ensuring that they had the best phone call that they've ever had, the best interaction that they had ever had with Fidelity. Now, it's gonna be a little bit different for you guys. Everyone's gonna have a little bit of a different role. But when you can learn to take that job that you're spending literally 40 hours a week or more doing, and you can simplify it so that a five-year-old can understand, or more importantly, your boomer boss, right, can understand what your job is, and you can explain it to them quickly, succinctly, concisely. I cannot begin to tell you guys how intelligent and in command that makes you look, right? There is nothing that makes you look better than when your boss looks at you and says, Jeremy, how, how does this work? Explain this to me. You've got 60 seconds. And you get up there and in 30 or 40 seconds, you give a thorough and concise explanation of what you've been working on for the last three months, right? That is the key to executives' heart, right? They want you to move like this. They want everything this quickly. So if you can learn to simplify, make it easy to digest, you're gonna, be, you're gonna make big fans within the upper leadership. And that's, I think this should go without being said, that's how you get promoted, right? Is, is you want to impress your leaders. Now, know your audience and prepare accordingly, right? I know my audience today, it's questionable if I prepared accordingly, but I know at least who I'm speaking to. So that allows me to cater the message, right? So you're communicating in a direct fashion. If you know that you're gonna go in and you have a meeting with your boss's boss, and you're gonna give them that spiel about what you've been working on for the last three months, right? You can cater the message to that. You can make it quick and pithy. You can ensure you cut out any BS, any, any sort of extra stuff, and you get right to the heart of the matter. Whereas if you're having a meeting with your own teammates, again, your, your tone changes completely. The way you deliver the message changes completely. Far more casual, far more comfortable. You're not trying to impress anybody, you're just talking amongst friends, right? So know your audience and cater the message appropriately. Lastly, for effective communication, I've spent the last five minutes talking about how to present yourself, how to speak appropriately, how to email, how to write appropriately. But lastly is learn how to listen effectively. Okay, communication's a two-way street. The vast majority of your communications are not gonna work like the one that you're experiencing right now, right? Where I'm talking at you guys and you're sitting and listening and taking notes, right? That's not how 99% of your interactions with people are gonna work. There's a give and take. If you're, how many of you, by show of hands, how many of you have, have got a person that comes to your mind that you know when you're talking to them, they cannot wait for you to shut up so that they can get what they want to say out of their mouth? Show of hands. Don't be that person, right? Simple rule, 
Okay? When somebody else is speaking, listen to them intently. Lean forward, right? Subtle body language. Lean forward. Cock your head. Nod, right? Smile. Laugh when they say something that's supposed to be funny, even if it's not. Laugh, right? Show engagement with them that shows that you're not just hearing, but you're actually listening intently, okay? All right. Next jump, next bullet point here. Be coachable and curious. When you get into your first role, I've already heard this today in some of the sessions I've been sitting in, and if you haven't heard this, let me be the first to tell you. When you graduate from ECU, that doesn't mean you really know much of anything, okay? What it means is that you've demonstrated the capability to be coachable and to be teachable. You spent four years being a sponge. That means something. It means a lot more than any of your specific skill sets might that you develop coming out of school, okay? So be coachable, look for ways to learn. Don't wait for feedback. Go seek it out, right? Don't wait for someone to come to you and try to explain and you know, beat into your thick skull the thing that you need to be told. When you do a project, when you get off that call, for anyone that's in a call center like I was, when you wrap up that, that you know, analysis with the big boss, where you got your 60 seconds of shine, immediately go to your team, go to your boss. Hey, walk me through it. How did I do? Where did I suck? How can I get better? What did I do really well? Right? Go seek that feedback out immediately. This kind of goes hand in hand, the next point here, but take ownership of your own development. Right? Corporate America is a great, it's a great place for you to develop your career and develop your skills. However, it is very easy to sit and go completely unnoticed. When you work for a company that's 70,000 plus people or got a friend of mine that works for NTT Data, they've got like 300,000 employees. It's outrageous. It is so easy to blend right in to that crowd. And as much as your boss may want to help and may want to show you how to improve, they're busy, they're bootstrapped for time. If you want to grow, you've got to go seek it out. You've got to go find the opportunities to take you to the next level. People will help you when you get there, but you've got to show the initiative. Make sense? All right. Next one. And I'm going to put you guys to the test here at the end of our session. Ask intelligent questions. Okay? How many of you have heard by show of hands, there's no such thing as a dumb question? I'm here to tell you that is definitively wrong. You can ask a very stupid question and look very stupid by asking it. Okay? I've seen it play out time and time again. You ever been in a classroom where the teacher spends like 10 or 15 minutes explaining a very specific topic and then you see that hand kind of slowly like, right, creep up and then they basically ask the teacher what they just spent the last 15 minutes describing, like they just ask them what, the, you know, what, what, what the hell is going on, right? There is such a thing as stupid questions. There is singularly nothing that you can do to demonstrate your own capability and intelligence than asking a well thought out question. It will demonstrate your intelligence far more than a well thought out answer, right? Asking questions is harder. It's, you have to be far more creative and you have to be far more insightful to ask a good question. So that means if you're going into a scenario in which you know you're gonna get an opportunity to ask about whatever the topic might be, prepare in advance, come up with questions. Keep your notepad out during the discussion, and as that question pops into your head, write it down. And then when you get to the end of the session, refine it a little bit, right? That was just your quick, that was your first draft of that question. Refine it. Let two or three other questions go by so you can continue to think if that's what you have to do. But make sure that when you ask that question, it's a good one. I had a, a meeting the other day where I got to do a dinner event with uh, one of the Navy SEALs that was on the Osama bin Laden raid. And it was really, really cool. I got to listen to this guy talk about all the preparation that went into it and the actual execution of the event when they were there in the night. And I asked him a question at the end of his talk. 
and he, he kind of looked at me like this, and he said, I've been talking about this topic for almost 20 years, and nobody has ever asked me that question, right? Now, I don't say this, and I'll tell you what the question was, because it wasn't anything groundbreaking. But the point is, is that when you ask a thoughtful question, it stands out. It demonstrates your intelligence. It demonstrates that you're listening. It demonstrates that you see to the heart of a matter far more quickly than the people around you do. And if you're in the workforce and that's what you're trying to do is demonstrate those qualities, there's no better way to show it than that, okay? Last two sections for this topic. Have humility and don't make excuses, okay? You're gonna get your opportunity where you're gonna knock that presentation out of the park and you're gonna get lauded by senior leadership and they're gonna hold you up on a, on a pedestal and say, look what this guy just did, look what this girl just did, they just killed it. All of you be like this person, right? The first thing that you need to be able to do is one, take that in, appreciate that moment, right? Because you worked hard for it, but two, you need to make sure that everybody in that room knows you didn't do it by yourself, right? Demonstrate that, hey, this was a team effort. I was part of a team. I'm simply the person here, the spokesperson for this, this project, right? And in many cases, you guys will experience that. That's, you will often be a spokesperson for a project that you didn't actually do most of the work on, right? Make sure you're quick to give other people the shine and bring them in when you're getting praise. And then when something does go wrong, own that, right? So look, this is what being a leader is all about. It's not fun, it's not glamorous, and it's certainly not sexy. When things go right, you have to give away all the credit. And when things go wrong, you have to take all the blame. Nobody wants to do that. And it's easy for me to stand up here and say that to you guys, right? It's much harder when your stomach just dropped because you just got that call from your boss that you need to come into his office. And you're sitting in the meeting, and if you're like me, your face gets beat red because you can't hide it, right? And you're embarrassed, and you feel isolated, and you feel lonely, and you feel like you are the biggest moron on the face of the earth. It can be really easy to want to point at why it was somebody else's fault when you're in that moment, right? Your team might not even be in the room. It might just be you and your boss. It would be easy for you to be able to say, oh, you know, Spencer dropped the ball on this one, guys. Like he, look, if, if he had gotten me the information, you know, he got it to me at the 11th hour, so I wasn't able to. Nobody cares. Your boss certainly doesn't care. That didn't make the thing that just got messed up fixed. That didn't fix anything. All it did was show that you lack character, and that you lack integrity, and that you're going to be willing to throw somebody under the bus, right? So. Be willing to take the, the blame when things go wrong and give away the credit when things go right. Now, I think this kind of leads itself nicely into the next thing, which is to, to build a village, okay? You guys are not going to experience success on your own, right? There's a reason, there's a theme. When you listen to successful people, you constantly hear them talk about all the people that helped them get there. Right? When you hear about athletes, when you hear about successful business people, you're, it's, you hear this just real every single time of, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for so-and-so. You know, or they're pointing somebody out in the crowd. Or even this morning, Mike could have come up here. Dean Harris could have come up here. And he could have taken credit for this whole event and all the hard work that he put into it. And how he knew all the right people and was able to make this thing happen. What did he do instead? He thanked Paige. He thanked the organization staff and the support staff, right? So recognize that it takes a village to help you guys get to where you want to be. That means when you join a team, get to know your colleagues, right? Especially if you're working from home or you have a hybrid work environment, it's really easy to not engage in any sort of a, a meaningful way with the people on your team, right? So whether it's virtual, whether it's in person, Find ways to meet your teammates, get to know them, learn about their lives, and show genuine interest. Be open to mentorship and guidance, right? If someone wants to show you something, like if you're the new guy on the team and somebody wants to kind of take you under their wing and show you some stuff, help you avoid mistakes, appreciate that, right? Recognize that for what it is. That's someone looking out for you. That's someone trying to bail you out. Engage with people outside of your team. Right? You're going to have a team of people that's you know, 7, 8, 10, 12, whatever it might be. 
and you need to get to know those folks. But at the end of the day, when you do this job for six or 12 months, you're gonna realize you guys all do the same exact stuff, right? You need to expand those horizons a little bit and go meet some folks that do different jobs that directly support your team or that you directly support, right? Go meet those folks. Because when you're ready for your next promotion, a lot of times it's not gonna look like this. It's gonna look like this, right? You're gonna be branching. You're gonna be going in different directions and you need to know those people to help make those connections for you. Support your teammates, celebrate them, right? When someone on your team gets that award for kicking ass and, and killing the numbers, right? Be their biggest cheerleader. Make sure that there's no doubt in anybody's mind that you're jealous and you're envious and you're wishing that, that, was, that, you know, that those praises were being heaped on your shoulders. There's nothing worse for, for team morale than when people feel like they, they can't celebrate anybody else's wins, right? So be willing to celebrate people when they do well. Recognize the value of diversity, right? Recognize that when there are people on your team that have different experiences than you, a different background than you, that they bring something to the table that you don't bring, right? It is quite easy for me to blab at you guys for 30 and 40 minutes, because it's who I am. Right? I like to blab, I like to run my mouth. What is not easy for me to do is when somebody asks me a hard question in a very sp specific moment in time, I'm not good at thinking about the answer on my feet. Right? There are some people, I had a friend I went to school with, he would go an entire meeting and he wouldn't say a single word. And somebody would ask a question and he would kind of like very casually like raise his hand and then he would drop a bomb in like seven words. Right? It was incredible. I never understood how we could do it. He still does it to this day. He'll, he'll summarize something that takes me a 15 minute explanation where I'm gonna go back to 1942 to explain it. He'll summarize it in two sentences and leave you with a profound feeling of, of impact, right? Those people are all around you guys, right? That quiet person, that person that's, you know, that, that doesn't go to any of the same events that you go to, doesn't show up at any of the stuff that you show up to, they bring something of value that is really important because you will never have it the way that they do, right? Going back to that strengths and weaknesses thing. They've got strengths that you'll just never have. And lastly, show up to the optional events, all right? As part of building your village, you can't just do it between the hours of nine and five. Right? When they do the happy hours, show up to them. It doesn't matter if you don't. I don't drink. I show up at all the happy hours. And you know what I do? I get a water, and people laugh, and they'll, they'll make a joke about it. And I've got some canned lines that I can go to about how, you know, I, don't look at me because you're the alcoholic, right? Like, if, if you don't drink, that's fine. Show up anyway, right? If they do a 5K and you haven't run further than the distance of, of you know, your couch to the refrigerator in the last six years, show up with a 5K anyway and walk it right? It's, it's about the opportunity you get to go deeper with people, to make those connections, to build those relationships, because then what's going to happen is next month, next year, one of your teammates gets promoted. They go to that job. They tell you about how awesome that job is, and then they help bring you up to that job, and you get promoted right after them. And now the two of you are the two amigos running things on the new team, right? It happens all the time. All right, last piece here. And it's one that I'll go over really quick because we've kind of already indirectly touched on it, which is take the initiative. There's a great quote from a modern philosopher named Marshawn Lynch. He says, I'm about that action, boss, right? That's it, guys. Be about the action. Get stuff done. For any of you that don't know who Marshawn Lynch is, he's not a philosopher. He's a football player. Go look him up. Actually, I take that back. He absolutely is a philosopher in every way. Awesome guy. I'm be about the action, guys, right? Take the initiative. Look for problems, right? President Obama did an a interview a while back, and he was, he was at a university. He was giving a speech, and he was asked by a college student what he looked for as a boss, right? What did he look for in somebody on his staff, on his team, when he was hiring, right? And this is the President of the United States, and you know what he said? He said, someone who takes initiative. That was the first words out of his mouth. He wants somebody who isn't going to be waiting for him to tell them what to do, right? I've got news for you. Your boss is busy. They are extremely busy. 
and their boss is breathing down their neck because their boss is breathing down theirs. And so it continues, right? Forgive my French, but have you ever heard the quote, you know, shit rolls downhill, right? So it starts at the top, and by the time it gets to the bottom, your manager is feeling a lot of pressure, right? It takes time for them to seek you out, take you away from your job, and walk you through what they need you to do. That takes time, valuable time that they probably don't have. On the flip side, if you guys on that team, right, you know what kind of problem, you guys are in, in meetings every week talking about the problems you're trying to solve, right? If you know those problems are there, come up with a solution, bring it to your boss. I swear to you, they will love you forever. They'll show up at your wedding. They'll show up at your kids' bar mitzvahs. Like they will love you forever if you find answers to problems for them, okay? So look for those opportunities. Step in and fill the void. Take ownership of the problem. Don't be too high and mighty for any task, right? There's a lot of problems that, that you'll run into on your team that don't fall under your job description that seem like simple stuff. We had a guy on our team that kept bringing fish to work and kept leaving it in the fridge and it was going bad and it was stinking up the refrigerator, right? So what did we do? We, you know, we had a group of guys that we all volunteered every Friday. We were gonna go through the fridge for the entire floor, mind you, and we we're gonna clean the fridge out. Make sure that didn't happen anymore, right? Super silly little thing but it was one last thing that your boss had to have on his plate when his, bo when his boss was emailing him at two o'clock on a Tuesday because John from accounting brought fish in and left it in the fridge again, okay? Let's solve those problems. Lastly, think critically and become the go-to person when there is a problem on your team, right? So when there is an issue, when something's coming up, when your boss is in crunch mode because it's the end of the quarter and he's got to get to the earnings reports and he's got to get all this stuff filed in time, be the one that your boss wants to go talk to. And how do you do that? Well, you build trust, you learn to communicate, you take initiative, you get to know your teammates, you build your village. That's how you get the call when something's going down and your boss needs help. And you might be wondering, why would I want that role? Why would I want my boss to call me at seven o'clock on Friday night when something needs to get done, right? You want that because you do that two or three times and you're on the launch pad, right? You get that next step, you get that next promotion, you get that next raise, right? Now, if you don't want any of those things, then don't do that. If you wanna blend in, basically don't do anything I've told you to do today if your goal is to just blend in, right? But if you want those things, if you want your career to move quickly, if you want to raise your income potential, if you want respect of your peers, these are the steps to do it. Last one, bonus tip, and then we'll wrap it up. When you are in a meeting, when you are meeting with your boss's boss, when you are in sessions like this, put your phone away. Just do it, just trust me, just do it. Put your phone away, don't pull it out. If you can do better than I did today and not have your notes on your phone, you actually have them printed out or written down, do that. I'm telling you, it actually matters to people that are your grandparents' age and your parents' age. Right, you know what they see when you guys whip your phone out for something? They see their kid. They see their kid who isn't doing their college assignments on time and who they just had an argument with last week because they want to drop out because finance 101 sucks. That's what they see, right? When you keep your phone away, when you look him in the eye, when you ask good questions, when you ask about his family, when you ask about his son that's failing finance 101 because he complained about it in your one-on-one -on -one last week and you remembered, right? That builds those relationships with the people that you want to build them with. So, with all that said, now we've got a, a page full of notes from Cole that I'm gonna assume was taken from all morning and not just this session. Questions. What kind of questions do you have around success in the workplace? Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, so the question is, is how do you highlight your weaknesses in an interaction with you know, your boss or like a hiring manager or something like that? Um, there's a couple of different approaches. It's Sydney? Yeah. So Sydney, there's a couple of different ways to approach that. I would tell you it's different if you're in an interview versus talking to your, your boss, right? If you're in an interview, you're, you don't want to portray it as a weakness. What you want to portray it as, as an opportunity for improvement, right? So a way in which you can get better at a certain thing. Um, and what you really want to do is like you want to strategically choose what your weakness is that you're going to divulge, right? So what I mean by that is, is like nobody wants to hear that you're a perfectionist and you just do everything perfectly all the time. And that's really your weakness, right? It's, it's your cross to bear. But you also don't want to like completely throw yourself under the bus, right? I have been known to be very blunt in my interviews. And I've had people tell me that you kind of stepped on your own foot. Like we didn't need to know that, right? So you got to be strategic about it. And, and go into the interview knowing, one, be prepared for that question, and then two, have a way to demonstrate what you're already doing to remedy that weakness. So you might say, whatever, like my weakness is that, you know, I don't do well with confrontation. Um, and, you know, but I recognize that. And so what I've been doing is, is I've been working on my, you know, my communication skills. I've been, you know, seeking people out when I have a disagreement with them rather than letting it fester and, and get, on, get under my skin. Like, you kind of give them the ways you're already working to improve it. Now, if it's your boss, this is a very different conversation. You should be really upfront with them, right? Because the way, if you tell your boss what you're not very good at or what you struggle with, one, they're gonna help you get better at it, but two, they're gonna set you up for success, right? They're not, if, you, if they know that you really struggle with speaking in front of a group, they're not gonna put you in front of the, the board of directors on a night's notice to present the team's numbers for the last quarter, right? They're not gonna do that to you if you've told them that you struggle with that, right? Or maybe they will, but after two months of you guys practicing and rehearsing and working, right? So that's how I would tackle it, depending on if it's interview or boss. Um, be really upfront with your boss, let them know, because they'll make sure that you get taken care of. What else, guys? Yeah. You emphasize the importance of seeking feedback. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the question is, is what kind of questions do you ask when you're seeking out feedback from you know, your peers, your, your, your family, people you trust? Um, I, I would keep it pretty simple. I would say, um, you know, give them context for why you're asking. And then like, ask them, like, hey, you've known me for X amount of years. Like, what are the things you think I'm really good at? What are the things you think I'm not so good at, right? Um, you know, what are the things that, you know, knowing, knowing me the way that you do, knowing the dynamics, right? Knowing that I'm about to try to go into the workforce next year, what are the things that you've seen in your corporate experience that would lead you to believe that I'm well-prepared or I'm ill-prepared, right? So again, it's not, it's pretty like straightforward stuff, but it's, it's, it's about not shying away from the hard responses you're going to get, leaning into those, and don't, don't get defensive. If you ask for feedback and then you get defensive, like you look like the, the, biggest, the biggest dummy on earth, right? Like if you're, if you're going to ask for the feedback, be prepared to take it. And when you leave the office, if you need to go stew on it and you need to be a little pissed off about it, go do that. But don't, don't get defensive in that interaction because then they're going to look at you, hey, you asked. I'm just giving you what you asked for. Does that answer your question? Cool. Yeah. So let me make sure I understood the question. So I, you were saying people with lots of diverse backgrounds in the workforce, and then you were asking about kind of nine to five. I missed that piece. Mm -hmm. Right. So 
so how do you engage with those types of people? Yeah, that's a very good question. So the question was, how do you engage in a meaningful way with those people who do just kind of punch the clock and want to go home, right? They do their nine to five, or you know, if you were in a meeting with Matt Slate earlier, he talked about they had a girl on their team during COVID that was her status on her team's thing was not ready for two years. And they found out she was in Costa Rica the entire time, right? So how do you engage with those people in a meaningful way? Um, I would, I'll give you two, two answers. The first one would be know where to spend your time. If they are not there to engage with you in any way, you can take it as a challenge and you can try to like get through to them or you can just recognize that, hey, this is not a person that's probably gonna engage with me. Let me spend my time on the people who will. All right, so that's, that's one solution is don't chase them down. Just let them be if that's the choice that they're making. Now, the second piece is if there's something there, right? You know, whatever, but there, there's that intangible thing where you're like, you know, I, I think this person either, like I wanna know this person or, you know, I feel like this person just needs someone to reach out to them, right? I think just being genuine and asking them if you can meet on their terms, right? If they don't like going out after work, I have a colleague, she is strictly nine to five. If you have anything that happens at 501, she is not interested, okay? So for her, it's, can I take you out to lunch so that we can talk, right? You get them during their work hours, you get them in the time that they've designated for this purpose in their life, right? Um, if they are, you know, if they live abroad or they live in a different state or something like that, get on a Zoom call with them. Find a time that's convenient for them. If that means you gotta get on the call at the call at 8 p.m., do it, right? Because you're, you're, you're already in that position where you're reaching out anyway. Go ahead and make it convenient for them as possible. Um, but I, I would tell you, just be weary of, of, I hate to say it's wasting your time, but of diving too deep into trying to engage with someone that doesn't have any interest you're just going to spin your wheels. Does that make sense? Yeah, go ahead, Will. So, um, I'm choosing your first company as a young fellow. Do you, would you rather choose a company that has a higher starting salary or the, or the other company where with a low starting salary but, salary, but you can rank up faster? Yeah, so the question was in your first job, do you take the company that's going to pay you better or the company that you think maybe has a little bit better prospects over time. Um, I would say it, it kind of varies depending on the circumstance. Um, if you are, I would generally tell you to look for the company with the better prospects over time. Um, however, money talks and there is a certain amount of money where it's like, you gotta, you gotta do what you gotta do, right? So if you're talking like, you know, a five or $10,000 pay difference, I would definitely be going with the company you feel has better prospects. Um, I will throw this out there though for you guys. If you're in a lucky enough position that you have a company that wants to throw a lot of money at you, but maybe you've heard bad things about them online, or you had a friend that worked there that didn't like it. If they want to pay you like 50, 60 grand more than somewhere else does, you take that jam damn job and you run. Like you go do that job, do it for your 12 or 18 months, because then what you can do is you can parlay it into the next role at that company or at some other company that you think is a, a better fit for you. And you can go in at a, at a you know, higher level, at a more senior level, or at a certain uh, pay um, that you wouldn't have otherwise been able to get. So it's sort of situational. I know that's not a full answer to your question, but that's kind of a nuanced circumstance that I think would be worth evaluating. Yeah. All right, guys, we got time for one more. Anything else? Yeah, go ahead, Susanna. So the question was, you get to the 11th hour, you get that late piece of information, it affects your ability to get to meet your boss's deadline. You take responsibility for not meeting the deadline, but how do you also make sure that you convey why it happened, right? So the, the first thing I would tell you, Sudina, if you guys haven't noticed this is a trend, right? I'm gonna, be, I'm gonna tell you to like be direct, right? 
tell them, right? Hey, I'm, I'm really sorry this didn't get done on time. Ultimately, this was my fault. Let me give you some context as to what was going on. Tell them what happened, right? Look, the thing is, is your boss is not a dummy. They probably know, just like all your teachers know, when you've got that one student that doesn't do anything in the team project, like your teacher knows, right? Like they're not dumb. So if you go to them and you explain the situation, you say, look, you know, here's what we were waiting on. I had this final piece of information. You don't even need to name drop the person. They know who was responsible for that piece of information because it's a small team, right? You know, so if they've only got a dozen people, like they're gonna know who is responsible for that. You say, look, we were waiting on, you know, X, Y, Z information to come in. We didn't get it until literally this morning. You know, so you know, that, that's, that's what happened. I, I'm really sorry. How, and then you, maybe you could say to them like, how would you like me to handle this if it ever happens again? Right, so like getting their insight on like, maybe, maybe you could have submitted the project on time and just left that person's stuff out and explained like, hey, here's the project. It's not complete because this information is missing, but we can tackle that when you're ready, right? Something like that. Um, so I would be pretty direct. You don't need to throw anybody. You don't need to drop a name necessarily, but just make it clear like what part of the project fell through and then ask for their feedback to say, how can I do, how can I make sure this doesn't happen again? Because the reality is, is that they've probably been in your shoes a few years earlier, or maybe many years earlier. They know what it feels like to have a team member that didn't come through and pull their weight, and they've figured it out. Like they navigated it somehow, so now they can pass that on to you. So you want to be, again, if you come in defensive, you're not in a position where you can learn anything from that. If you come in from a position of, I, I don't, I'm figuring this out as we go. I've never had this happen to me before on a team. You know, can you walk me through how you would handle it? That's going to be handled a lot better than if you got super defensive and tried to hide it or sweep it under the rug or blame that person. Cool. All right, guys, it is 1254. So I'm going to let you get out of here. Thank you for your time. Thank you.